Diamond and David Dubai are the guys who woke me up. Thank you very much. who gets what's going on, who's openly talking about it, who's looking at what needs to happen, more importantly, instead of just braining out and telling us about the problems, he's actually taken his whole life and changed it and put himself out there and building and sharing what's going on. And when I, I mean, immediately supported him on Patreon, and then like weeks later, got some seats in the mail, and I was like, this guy gets it. He gets it. He knows that this genetic diversity is real wealth. That these seeds are priceless. I can't buy, I can't, I can't buy these seeds. So it was just really inspiring and remains inspiring. And I also want to thank for an inordinate amount of work that's gone into this conference. It's gone yeah. into this beautiful. Yeah. 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 So a heartfelt round of applause and gratitude and appreciation for all that you've done for this conference and for your talent at large. And with that, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Great job. And we go, John. Um, so before I start, and this is the end of the conference, so at the end of this uh, talk, we're going to have about an hour to chit-chat in the atrium, and we're going to have several auctions. We have a, like a 50-pound crystal from Gorgeous Awesome that we're going to auction off, and Rex is picking a piece of artwork he's going to auction off. And I have a mint condition Velikovsky Worlds in Collision uh, Collector's Edition. I believe it's the fourth edition that we'll also auction off. And all the proceeds will go to paying the $54,000 bill for this conference. 
<laughs> now, uh, if you saw my last talk, this one will not be a, rep a repetition because I don't prepare anything I do. And which is why people like to listen to me because the words I'm saying are things that I know and I make eye contact. And not only that, I typically can explain things to the layman because I, I typically don't like complex subjects. And what you're looking at here is a GIF made up of the pole shift. Uh, this is from the Northern Hemisphere from 1600 to 2015. And this will be part of the talk because I don't know if you got the gist, if you've heard all the talks here. The most important thing that's happening on Earth to humanity is this. The magnetic pole is not wandering anymore. See, the magnetic pole typically wanders uh, around the rotational pole of planets, typically. But when it stops and starts moving towards the equator, that's when a magnetic excursion occurs. And that began in ni about 1910, when the pole started to... See, this isn't migrating in, around near the North Pole, which it should do, but then it started to move. And it's that rapid movement, uh, according to Mavstar, the other night, the pole is now right off the shore of the Ukraine. And we have an update from the Mavstar oh, Observatory. And, and so the pole is rapidly accelerating, which is why we need to get these magnetometers worldwide, because the magnetic reversal is going to change humanity as we know it. And it, I believe it's what is driving um, cosmic catastrophe. So cosmic catastrophe has been described by Velikovsky. I mean, he, he really brought it to the forefront, and then it got smashed. And it got smashed because the way science works is that the current established science foundation is the one that gets to say what is going on. And at that time, he was against every single thing that they were saying was going on, which means every textbook is wrong, every university is wrong. And that is just impossible to happen. It will never happen. It typically takes decades for a new idea to be implanted in mainstream. But this one got smashed so good that nothing happened with it. Even after Einstein said that Velikovsky was right, all of his predictions had come true. We still haven't taught anything about um, the cosmic, catastrophic nature of our solar system. Everybody thinks it's always sunny. And now the catastrophe is the temperature is going to go up one degree. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> Since 70s, right? Um, one degree deviation since 70s. Yeah, but that's normal. So a 1.5 degree deviation of temperature at, always is normal. <clears throat> but what's not normal is when that deviation is localized, like in the Northern Hemisphere, during a grand solar minimum, and then it affects crops, so then it affects humanity. But a 1.5 deviation in temperature is normal. Five degrees is normal. What's not normal is when you get into the 15 and 10 range, which is pretty consistent. Every 100,000 years, we have multiple shifts in temperature that are catastrophic. These peaks are all catastrophic shifts. But on the peak, it's very quiet, calm, and warm, and very productive, which is very infrequently. 90% of all the time in the last half a million years, we've been in a deep ice age. So down here is where you have five miles of ice in New York, or three, not that it matters. <laughs> <laughs> and then that big lobe can shift. At one point it was over Wisconsin, sometimes it's over um, New York, and it also shifts around Europe. So ice ages are the norm for the last half a million years. And anyone tells you different, they're a liar. We have detailed analysis over the last three decades coming from Antarctica and Greenland where billions of dollars has been spent and the information has been found by hundreds of paleontologists and climatologists and they all know this. And they have very little argument that this, there's no way you can prove that this little warm spot here is man, but they can't say that because they need their job, right? They need their position at the university and they need their funding and they need their <laughs> tenure. And this is the problem with science, because we've gotten so compartmentalized. The multidisciplinary approach has been abandoned, and it was on purpose. When I got into academia in the early 90s, they had just shifted the chemistry floor away from the geology department, and physics was on the third floor, when they used to be on the same floor. Because a geologist needs to talk to the chemistry people and the physics people, because they're the experts. But we're not allowed to talk to them. 
So the expert geologist then has to become the expert chemist and the expert physicist, or if he's not that savvy, just be blind and be the geologist. And they're working off of textbooks. <clears throat> and unfortunately, these textbooks are incomplete. And what we've learned in the last decade is that uh, we're learning about the mechanism of the sun. And those of you in the room know that probably the sun controls the majority of everything that happens on our planet. And if you're a skeptic right now, just remember that during an eclipse, when, when that sun is covered, the temperature drops 10 degrees almost everywhere. And so the, if you can't see the effect of the sun, um, then you've just been indoctrinated for decades into this global warming nonsense. Yeah, and not only that, if you cannot see the fact that we have been much warmer than today, that they're lying to you, and that every scientist with a PhD in climatology knows they're lying and they don't say anything, and what's the purpose of that? It's to keep their job. And so the facts are right here. And the facts are that we are now <clears throat> about a thousand years past the longest interglacial ever recorded. And if you saw my first talk, the reason was because we got lucky. And there are so many layers of cosmic catastrophe that layer upon itself. And the reason we got lucky, oh man, where's the slide? It's coming up. Okay, I might not be able to find it. The reason we got lucky is because during the Dalton Minimum, there was a warming event. Let me use this slide. There is a thousand year cycle called the Donskard Erschger cycle that controls the output of the sun. Now, all you people that ask me what's the W per square meter when we show the graphs on the left, that's the wattage of the sun. And if the wattage of the sun flickers like a watt, we're dead. So there's a very tiny fraction of energy that needs to shift from the sun to kill all life or to send us into an ice age. It is very small and the sun is highly variable. And with modern telescopes, we now are recording micronova and supernova that are exploding stars are not uncommon. They're common. And just 10 years ago, we thought that the brown dwarf was uncommon, but we now know that there are solar systems that consist of just a single star that are floating blind through the, uh, the galaxy, the universe. The common theme is brown dwarf. And that was the theme of Velikovsky, that at one point, Saturn was the only sun we had. It's called the best sun. And this is corroborated by all mythology in the world. And they called it different things. Even the Egyptians knew of Ra, the sun god. And the sun god was there because if you went outside today and you looked up to the north, the sun would be there, only it would have been Saturn. And there would be nothing else in the night sky. And this went on for all of humanity until recently. And what happened was, we were in a polar alignment with Saturn, which is a brown dwarf floating through space, which we now know in the last 10 years is the normal condition for solar systems. It's, it's not the one we're in. The normal condition is for stars to be wandering out in space alone. Brown dwarfs. And if you're stuck near a brown dwarf in a plasma sheath, the environment contained in that solar system is perfect. And it's unchanging. Because the plasma sheath protects the environment from cosmic rays in space. So nothing bad happens there. And I've heard about that place, it's called Eden. <laughs> the Garden of. And so we lived in this realm, probably, it's my opinion, that for about, for millions of years, humans lived in this realm, millions. Because we can now, as uh, anthropologists, trace back hominids just like us. And, and each year it gets you know, further back, two million, three million. But if you go and look at the geologic record, the beginning of this ice age is five million years ago. There was a mass extinction that changed the planet. And five million years ago to today, we've pretty much been in the same cosmogenic environment, except when we look at mythology, we've only recently learned about planets and stars, and that's only in the last few thousand years. So some people believe that as early as let's say 11,500 years ago. And what you're looking at here is the Iron Cross. Now this gets us into some esoteric science because this is, and you know, how many of you know the clock cycle by Doug Boat? Okay, so this is similar to his clock cycle. And 
the vertical, this is a 26,000 year procession of the equinoxes. This would be the astrological chart for all you astrologers. And, and the reason I want to show you this is because we have now melded, you know, ancient information, esoteric astrology matches geology. And the blue dots represent um, geologic catastrophes that people like me have went out and studied and found. And they all seem to fall on a clock. And um, specifically, we're just looking at the last half a million years because the ice core data provides us with this extremely fine-tuned information so that we know what these catastrophes are. And what the catastrophes are is on this flexure point, all the time, every 26,000 years, the sea level comes up upwards of two to 400 feet. And that just happened 11,500 years ago. Sea level came up 400 feet. It flooded all the evidence of 30 million people in North America called the Clovis or the Salutrian, whatever you want to call them, and the, the mound builders. And they, those were the true ancient ones. And so all that information is lost on these cultures because it's in an area where we can't do any archaeology exactly 300 feet underwater, where it's like impossible to scuba dive and no one has the funding to take a submarine down there and, and their brushes underwater to find shit. <laughs> like you could go down there and suck it up with vacuums that you have and there's so many, many artifacts at that level. <clears throat> so almost all of the scientific community knows that we had huge cultures 13, 15,000 years ago, but there are governments hiding that. You're not allowed to scuba dive off India below 110 feet. Because if you go below there, you may find Atlantis or some other crazy shit. <laughs> because it is there. We've already sent submarines down there and found cities and pillars and things that are probably, and could only have been exposed 8,600 years ago or older. And they're trying to teach us that we learned to farm six to 8,000 years ago. <laughs> So who the hell built these cities? <laughs> Which are everywhere. <clears throat> now why I want to bring it to the Iron Cross is because this brings together all types of symbology, religion, astrology, and actual scientific discovery all together at once. And it took an architect named Randall Carlson to put together this graphic. Who was able to do it because he's not indoctrinated into the current academic system which is not allowing us to learn nothing. What it's allowing us to do is to fatten the multinational corporations, make a few people billionaires, and the rest of you paupers and slaves. And they compartmentalize the information to keep you dumb, and they exhaust you, and they work you to the bone and to keep you compliant. And it's very difficult to escape the situation. But during these catastrophes we escape but very few people make it. But there's good news. Because we're on this flexure point. And what happened on this flexure point is a Heinrich event and a Heinrich event and another event and another event which all correspond to massive melting of glaciers. Which already has happened, right? <coughs> but what happens after we pass the cusp, which is right now, which is there's no more ice. There's a catastrophic loss of all the rest of the ice in the geologic record due to an event. We don't know what that is. We don't know what that is, but all the ice all of a sudden goes away and then because of the event, not only does it all flood to the south through rivers and destroy everything, it then gets very cold for the whole rest of the cycle. And it's that cold part of the cycle when these cultures that are missing thrive, it's the part of the yuga, what we call the golden age. And it only occurs after the majority of the population dies. And they slowly recover in a very difficult situation. And by the time we get over here, before we all die again, we have pyramids. <laughs> we have pyramids and we don't need language and we are just living in some type of system that we can't even comprehend. The pyramids have hundreds of miles of canals beneath them. The pyramids are clearly machines that did something. We don't know what they did, but they, it, was, it was purposeful. And, and these cultures didn't create trash and they didn't destroy environments that we're aware of. But we are, because we're at the end. This is the Dark Age. And this flexure point, it ends. The Dark Age ends, and then an enlightening period for 11,000 to 12,000 years begins. But it's very difficult and cold. 
<coughs> but it's not cold all over. And a lot of people have a misconception that these catastrophes um, are unsurvivable. But they're absolutely survivable because we're all here at the conference. But there's some ways to mitigate the dangers of the cosmic catastrophe that we're all living. See, because if you try to convince uh, the layman that you're living a cosmic catastrophe right now, they're like, get the <laughs> Because they still go to work, and they still have to pay their taxes, and they still pay $5 per latte. But what they don't know is the cancer rates are increasing 3 to 5% above 70 degrees north, because we can't notice that type of change. And that's the way the change happens slowly until the big event happens. And the big event in our lives can only be very few things. Because of the way we've uh, organized our shitty society in the slave model, we now live in a you know, place where the majority of the population thinks food is in stores, and they're living in a place where food is only in stores. And many of those people don't even have stores with actual food in them. <laughs> right? Food deserts are everywhere. I spent years in the poorest parts of the inner city trying to fix the food desert situation, and the only way you can do it is to teach the people how to grow food. Not only that, these people are so dumbed down that in the poorest sections of most cities is where orchards in the early 1900s were planted along the streets. And there are whole uh, African American communities in West Philly that live in areas where there are 50,000 pounds of organic peaches growing on the road, and they were taught by their parents that these, those peaches were dirty. And I had to go in there, the only white person, to teach a whole community that they were clean. And most of the people didn't believe me. But the ones that believed me were eating organic peaches. <laughs> <laughs> and I even had little kids, because I planted some uh, gardens on vacant lots there that would sneak out of the house to come ask me, where is those berries that I can eat that my mother doesn't want me to eat? Because the kids are hungry. Yeah. And their parents won't let them eat natural organic food from the woods. So, go ahead. You, have, you said something, cancer rates are about Yeah, we're about to get to that. All right. So not only is there, we have a situation where we're in a food desert and that if, let's say we cut off the food supply for a month, most people would die because they don't know what to do. Most people sitting here only have a week or a few months of food that's actually nutritious that will not keep you sick because rice and beans and bullets is, you're dead. <laughs> rice and beans makes you sick. You might live, but you get sicker and sicker and die. So you need to weigh ways to wildcraft or wild harvest, wild alfalfa, or other extremely nutrient-dense plants that grow everywhere right outside. It's not hard to learn, you just have to Google it. <laughs> if it works. Yeah. Or use Bray, any of these hundred search engines. There's even one called Ecosia that'll plant a tree in uh, Indonesia if you use it. So there's many ways you can do your own research, but you have to get off your ass and do it. And because the event, is, there's no one in the world that can predict what's going to happen. But I'll tell you what's going to happen in the next two decades. The magnetic reversal is going to occur. These cosmic rays are going to continue to increase. And the, the, the work coming out all over the world now being accepted. It try, they tried to debunk it at CERN, this is the work by Svensmark. But they proved it using the cloud experiment, which cost a billion of your dollars. And it proved that if cosmic rays increase, clouds nucleate more and the Earth gets colder. That's what it proved. And have you heard CERN say that it's going to get colder? No. no. It's, it's, they don't. They won't. Have you heard CERN say that there's going to be major flooding and the 100-year flood is going to be the decadal flood and the 500-year flood is now going to be common? No. Because they don't want to scare you. But they know that. Every s smart scientist that actually reads the literature knows exactly what's going on. But, they, but then let's, you try to talk to your wife. <laughs> and she watches daytime sh shows or whatever. <laughs> and now the, uh, you're getting divorced. I mean, these, <laughs> these are the real issues. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Right here. These are the real issues. So, so I don't really know how to recommend a good way to, to get by by getting by, but we've been pretending all along, so just keep pretending to do what you do. Keep pretending at your job until you can get out. And when you can, say, hey, <laughs> no, that's zero minutes notice. <laughs> I love it when I'm in that position. <laughs> Remember when I told you I was going to stay for a year? Diamond, it's a little bit harder when you got three, four year olds to... Yeah, so everyone has a sob story. Everyone does. Each and every person in this room has something terrible that's happened to them, or has a problem, or has been called mentally ill, or whatever. 
but that's someone else's opinion. And they can suck it. Hey, I like that. Hey, that's nice to that. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> that's a lie. That's a lie. So there's a couple things you should take out of my talk. We've been cooling for thousands of years, according to the data. All paleoclimatologists know this, and that even this warm spike here is not even warmer probably than the medieval warm. It's probably not warmer than the Roman warm. It was probably two to five degrees warmer back then. Which is why everyone wore like a loincloth and shit and flip flops <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. There's very few people wearing loincloths and flip flops in Italy in the winter. They're not. But they were. And also, if you think that temperature rises and falls over 1,300 years of this catastrophic nature, up and down 10 and 15 degrees, is caused by a comet, then you're an idiot. Because once a comet hits, it only affects the Earth locally in that position. It would be a radial you know, collapse point, and then the system would recover in a few decades or hundreds of years. And what we have here is 1,300 or 2,000 years of different events that everyone's trying to explain by a comet or a, a one thing, and it's not. It's not a one thing, but it's guaranteed to be a thing. Because if we look at the last five million years, and I believe that this shift here is the shift that made humans that maybe in five decades from now, that they'll take Homo sapien all the way back here to the Emian extinction. That's my opinion. <clears throat> because it's really a good spot where this ice age pattern begins. And also I want to suggest that the reason that this graph gets wider is not because it's getting warmer or the cycle's getting bigger. It's because the older the information in the ice, the, the shittier it is. I mean, it's got to be. If you're bringing up an ice core sample that's two million years old, it's probably adulterated. Because it's been sitting there for millions of years. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we have better, this is really good information here. Very high resolution. Which says that the celestial mechanics of our solar system controls the weather. Meaning our position relative to the sun. And what the other graphs show is that other cosmic catastrophes can happen on the planet. And the, the longer we live, the more we know that it's probably comets, it's probably outbursts from the sun, and then there's response mechanisms. Because if you were to hit the earth with a hot blast that burns it, it would evaporate water, and then within a few days, you would now drop the temperature 30 degrees and be freezing. So you'd go from one extreme to the next. And at the smaller scale, when we talk grand solar minimums, and super grand solar minimums, that's this pattern. It's even smaller. So the scales and the layers of forcing mechanisms externally are epic. But I think it's all driven by the first slide I showed you. And let me see if I can get that up here. You think it, it could be anything to do with manipulation of data or with people that know or do you think that people like people like us will drill and get real data and then do the information and hopefully not be... Uh, Unfor unfortunately, this is what I think it is. <clears throat> There's not a lot of people willing to go out on a limb. There's a handful. Like the last person to really try to rile up cosmology was Velikovsky. And now the group that's riling it up, the Electric Universe group, Thunderbolts Project, thunderbolts.info, if you want to go look, <laughs> That group is kind of a, a quiet bunch. Yeah. So they're just whispering in the corner because they know what they do if they get loud in front of the camera. Uh, They'll be shut down. But as we whisper in the corner, this community grows. And you can whisper to other people or you can not whisper to them, depending on how, what their reaction may be. But, I mean, I know what a tipping point is and we're nearing a tipping point of changing science. But it's happening at the same time when the shit's about to hit the fan. <laughs> so what do you worry about? Saving your ass or saving science? Your ass. Yeah, because science is dead. Yeah, it's religious. It, not only that, it's science fiction. So there's so many breakthroughs coming out right now that the people that have been indoctrinated or stuck in those positions of power at the universities will not go there. They won't go there. 
But someone like me that still shits in a bucket in his barn trying to build a house <laughs> will go there. So I'm going to sum it up real quick because I'd like to talk to the crowd. <clears throat> and let me break it down to you. The main driver, in my opinion, is the magnetic reversal. And I'm going to tell you why. There is now more and more evidence that every half of that, uh, let me get that amazing Randall Carlson picture up here. Because this is really the key. And I think that, where is it? Please come. There it is. I think that this is the key to everything. Because it brings in uh, magic numbers. It brings in uh, sacred geometry. It brings in the position of all the megaliths. It then brings in astrology. It brings in the Vedic texts. It brings in the procession of the equinoxes. And then it adds all the geology that field geologists like me have found. And say, hey, what if we put it on top of all this hooky shit? <laughs> it all lines up. <clears throat> so what that means is the ancients already knew what we're just learning. Yeah. And, that, and if the powers that be know about this catastrophe cycle, the cabal, whoever it is, it could be just a small group of people with extreme power. And I, I once postulated that the Ark of the Covenant was stolen as a thing. And it, it gives you that extreme power to control humanity. Just if you have it. Like a thing. Like, this is it. I control humanity. It's right there. I always knew that. And that would be the only way that something so devious could be kept from everyone. Because once you tell this guy, he's probably going to tell his girlfriend. So, so, and that's just my idea. But people know about this because the ancients knew about it. And they warned about it in their architecture. They warned about it in their texts. Our religions warn about the catastrophes. People knew tens of thousands of years ago, and they had a map. Not only that, Antarctica was ice-free recently because of the Piri Reis map, and everyone's like, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. So we have this map from, you know, <laughs> when Antarctica had lots of ice on it, where Antarctica doesn't have ice. And then if you look at the science, Antarctica has had ice for the last 13 million years which is not true, <laughs> because it's not true. Because when they got remote sensing and they looked under the ice, the Pure East map was exactly the picture that they saw under the ice. So the map they were using in 500 AD was a map made before then that Antarctica was ice free. Humans that made maps, that made ships, were around when Antarctica was ice free. All these facts are so obvious in our face that when you get to the level that many of you are in the room, it's like you could, if, imagine if we looked at our old textbooks, we'd be like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's so much evidence to not support all the cosmology that we've learned. <clears throat> there's so much evidence to support that gravity is more of an, uh, an effect than a law, because if you break it down to the beginning, it's all electric. It's all sound and light. And everything can be explained by those th three things. So language is unnecessary. But electricity, sound, and light are. Language is for dumb people. And I think that as we progress, we will be enlightened through this cycle, obviously, because it seems like every time there's a catastrophe of the sea level rise magnitude, we have high culture. And that would be Machu Picchu and the pyramids and the mound builders in North America. The reason there's so uh, slight evidence in North America is because I believe it was a major impact zone during the last cosmic catastrophe, which was not a comet. You know, it was multiple events. So any one of these events could have killed off the Clovis, but we have Clovis points all the way to 11.5. So this is what killed everything. But not everything, because mammoths lived all the way to here. And we know this archaeologically, but no one has taught that. Everyone in the world thinks that mammoths dying 11,500 years ago. But they didn't. So if mammoths can make it through all those catastrophes, we can make it through them. Because we did. Because we're here. Now everyone wants to know where to go. Well, how, what do I prepare for? <clears throat> you prepare for the magnetic reversal. Because that's what it's all about. When we look at the high... If, if you're listening to someone that says the last magnetic reversal was 750,000 years ago, they're uninformed. 
That was the last polar reversal. So what happens is every million or so, there's a polar flip on the Earth, where for most of the time, the North Pole is always up north. But it flips every 11,500 years or so. It flips, but it always ends up back on north. But every million years, that North Pole goes on down here and stays down there for a million years. And north is south, and south is north. So now we're, we're, the, in this, we're at a time when the North Pole is ready to go south. And if it is a polar reversal, then the whole magnetic reversal shit we're talking about pales in comparison to a polar reversal. What does that mean? What does that even mean? Does it mean the Earth has to stop and turn the other way? We won't know until we're there. <clears throat> but the magnetic reversal is occurring now. And I'm going to say it's probably not a polar reversal for a number of reasons. 95% of all magnetic excursions are just that. The polar field collapses, it stays around the equator for a while, and it just pops back up. But that period of time when the two poles are near the equator, the magnetosphere is so thin that if we go outside every day, we'll quickly die. So we would have to stay inside. We could go out at night, but you would still be bombarded by cosmic radiation. And it's something that you can't hide from. You can't go underground and hide from it, because it goes through the Earth. But what you do go when you go underground, you will be stopping the rest of the 9,000 other types of cosmic radiation that are also hitting you. Because there's not just cosmic rays, there's thousands of cosmic particles that are coming down, protons. And these are all energized. They'll hit a DNA strand and rip it. Cosmic rays can hit a DNA strand and flip uh, those tri, tri patterns. They literally will flip them and make you something else. So that if two humans got these flips and then they copulated, their baby wouldn't be a human. And I, and I make the funny joke that someday a woman's going to give birth and the baby will fly out. <laughs> and maybe meet another baby that flew out and then there'll be a new thing. <laughs> Because there's no need for evolution if you have instantaneous speciation. You mutate the species that are there, and two of the mutants meet. And then that's a new thing. And that's probably what evolution is. And can you imagine that time when we're all getting irradiated and humans are all sick, but one guy eats a lot of kombucha, and he's like, why is everybody sick? Because there's a way, there are ways to protect yourself. Things that you eat will protect you from this radiation. Fermented food, specifically. You should learn how to lacto-ferment. Lactobacillus prevents against radiation. Um, Leah, could, can you talk about uh, hemohem real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, <coughs> so uh, my, uh, my father's new wife is from Korea, and uh, she introduced me to this product called hemohem. It was developed by the Korean government, and it was specifically developed because they had a lot of employees who were working in labs and dealing with high amounts of radiation, and all of these people got sick by a variety of cancers. Um, and this product uh, is largely things like Angelica, uh, I'm trying to remember what other herbs, but it's largely Angelica and um, things that are called uh, uh, lymphocytes, and um, it has totally done the trick for, um, for those employees, and it's actually helped cure them, and I think that that's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. It's a cool product. Hemo H M O H I M. Hemo Hem. H E M O H I M. Uh, it's a little hard to get. You've got a. It's kind of like a an Avon <coughs> company. You know, there's like little franchises. You've got to find somebody that sells it. But if you look around online, you can find the folks that sell it. And occasionally, you can find it on Amazon. Rarely, but you can find it. But it's expensive, and most people don't have money. So you can research what's in it, and you can find it. Can these are pl these are plants that grow at higher elevation that are easy to find, like OSHA. And Angelica, they grow all over where we are. But they also mimic uh, water hemlock, which is the deadliest plant on Earth. So don't go out of your nitty and start picking shit that looks like <laughs> Angelica. Because <laughs> you're dead. When our friend went up in the mountain and ate the most poisonous plant on the mountain. He said, hey, I ate this plant. Like, is that bad? I'm like, oh, it's the most poisonous one. <laughs> Does that Especially mean I should... plants like OSHA, there's a lot of lookalikes and they can be toxic and fatal. Yeah, so go out with someone that's knowledgeable to wild mm -hmm. harvest. What about beryllium? Can you take beryllium to extract the, uh, the nuclear we're taking in our blood? Because we all are... Why beryllium? Um, why did they put the ammo bunkers in South Dakota? There's a, lot, a large state of beryllium and beryllium... Is so if you want to draw poisons out, it would have to be ionic. Yeah. It has to be an ionic thing. It doesn't matter what it is. 
So there are lots of things to, to extract toxins out of your body. And, and you don't have to buy beryllium because it costs money. Or where are you going to get it? For free, bro. It's, you know. Yeah, so there's lots of plants that are detoxifiers that are free. So please study wild plants. There is so much wild food outside that it's almost embarrassing that there's so many sick people in the, the, the earth. Because all you need is the right micronutrients present in your body to fight off the disease as it's coming. Everyone's all is susceptible to sickness, but people with the right micronutrients nutrient, in their body don't get sick, they don't get cancer. They can't, because when the cancer comes, the micronutrients allow the immune system to be in homeostasis and they fight it off. It's the moment we're out of balance. We've eaten too many GMOs. We stopped eating vegetables. We don't even have any micronutrients anymore in our body because we've been, we, there's a guy that ate Big Macs for 11 years and lived. What about grounding? <laughs> if you ground yourself, yeah, grounding is a good way to neutralize yourself. <laughs> Take your shoes off. But the most important thing you can do for your body is nutrition. And now, the, after they irradiated 400 million people to cure their cancer, the number one cancer cure is nutrition therapy and, and radiation. <laughs> We're still going to fry your ass, but we want you to eat well. I don't know if you've ever been on a cancer ward, but every single product they give those people are genetically modified and filled with garbage. All carcinogenic. It's, it, it, it's disgusting. Can you ground yourself? If someone has cancer, do you just ground yourself and eat? all organic? I'm just asking for that. I don't have any experience in that. I know the one thing that cures cancer is cannabis oil, Rick Simpson oil. And you can buy the book Phoenix Tears. And the success rates of, if you make the medicine correctly out of multiple indica strains, and if you guys want a copy of it, you can find a free PDF online if you search Phoenix Tears, uh, the Rick Simpson story. And it's recently been updated. We're over, there's certain types of cancer which with over 65% success rates by simply eating cannabis oil. Because the cannabis oil brings back your body's immune system into homeostasis. And not only that, there's breakthroughs in the last few months that are showing that autism spectrum is because the cannabinoid system in those autistic kids are missing a THC receptor. And that means all you have to do is give your autistic child THC and the symptoms will be removed. Wow. But, they won't have but do you know how contra... Because the THC is the high content. Oh, yeah. 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 It's not the CBD. So all these people are giving their kids CBD to stop the autism, and it's useless. But why is it depleted? It's not depleted. It's, it's missing. The normal cannabinoid system has a THC receptor, so when we smoke pot, we eat a high. <laughs> and it's just not there in the autism children. It's a missing portion of the cannabinoid system. So if you can replace it and keep it in there, it fixes uh, the symptoms. So that's what they take out, the most important part of it. Yeah. So it, it's so controversial. Can you imagine if the cure for autism for children is to get them all high? Yeah. <laughs> that is not going to fly. But the beauty of Rick Simpson oil is if you start to administer it as medicine at the same dose, in a few days or weeks, the child is normal. There's no effect, no psychoactive effect. Because cannabis is one of the most, uh, you keep needing more and more cannabis to get the same effect. But if you're not looking for effect and you're looking for health, you don't want to relax. At some point, the same, quickly, the same amount of cannabis will not affect you at all. So there is hope that there won't be high children, there will be well children, as soon as the politicians get their heads out of their asses. <clears throat> now the problem with that is we have the pharmaceutical industry, oh, yeah. the largest lobby yeah. in the world that is going to prevent that. So it's up to each and every one of you to break unjust laws and do what you have to do for your family. Because the most important thing is to survive and thrive in the times that are coming. And they're going to be bleak because the, the power structure, as the magnetic reversal occurs, they're waiting. They're waiting to start a war to distract you. They're waiting to create another controversy in the midst of your preparation to prevent you from preparing. So that when the event comes and it's the police state, you'll comply and go to Houston. Because the majority of people are sheep. They, don't, they think food comes from the store. And, it, and, and they'll promise you internet. <laughs> so the reason that uh, these lithium ion batteries are being built so big is so that they can lure you in when the grid goes down. They're going to have batteries and they're going to have internet and people are going to go there. And then they're not going to be allowed to leave.
So how do you get And then the 5G that? is set up. The infrastructure is there to control the population. First it's for technology, then it's for human control. Then how do you control that? How do you prevent people? How do you talk to people and save as many, and I think that's my problem, save as many as you can, right? That's not going to happen. So I'm going to wrap this up by the facts. If you live in a major city, you'll be consumed by the unrest because humans are compassionate creatures. The further you get away from the nightmare, the better chance you have of not experiencing it at all. Because if it's a grid down situation, people will not be able to leave those cities except walk. And if you're 500 miles away, everyone prior to you will eat them. Or steal what they have and kill them. And then eat them later when they're hungry. <laughs> so you can put yourself in a really good place to be in an Eden if, the, if and when an event occurs. If there is a major volcanic eruption, which there will be in the next few decades, forced by cosmic radiation and the waning magnetosphere, if it's VEIA, the planet will be dark for three to, three to ten years. And it will be a struggle. And if you do not have stockpiles, infrastructure, clean water, if you're downwind of it, all the surface water is poisonous. So you need water underground saved. Or, or we, we have a glacial till under our property that if we just dig down, it's all filtered already. Even toxic volcanic rain would probably be filtered in our region, but almost nowhere on Earth. You have to be by a glacial river. So there's very few places to go to be safe, but there are like-minded people and communities that can help you learn. <clears throat> there's no way to predict what we need, but if we're more self-reliant and more uh, resilient, um, I don't know if any of you listened to some of the interviews I did with Anita Bailey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so, this woman is a, a wealth of knowledge, and many people have even postulated this. If you, if you want to believe that you're prepared, go over to your uh, hmm. circuit box and turn off the breaker. Yep. Yep. Keep it off for seven days. <laughs> do an experiment. Because the first thing you have to do is eat everything in the refrigerator, or take it out and keep it cool. And just see how it works. Because in what's going to happen by 2023 is the grid's going to start failing when the sun wakes up again in cycle 25. Our magnetosphere has already waned so much that when the sun was active just a few years ago before it went dead, dead in this solar minimum of 2024, 20, we had M flares and, and coronal hull streams that were, that were taking down the grid. This is not supposed to happen. M flares should not be a threat to your life. And so what happens by 2023, we're already in a two-year drought for an X-flare, is an X-flare will probably be Earth-facing. And that will be the beginning of your first class on cosmic catastrophe. Because nothing's going to hit the Earth, but an invisible thing that's going to black out a section of it. And because of technology, we're going to be able to watch the chaos and unrest live. And they're going to show you that because they want you scared to death when they tell you to go to the city, the safe place with the Internet and then you won't be able to get out. That's just, these are my opinions. And, but they're based on uh, Occam's razor. You know, what's most likely to happen will probably happen. And all the crazy shit is crazy shit. So there's no reason to be depressed because it's inevitable. And you're not the only one that will experience, everyone will. And if you want to get a positive message out of this, the system we live in is broken, it's disgusting. You're being poisoned. <coughs> It's a, it's a false narrative that you're going to get a good job and all that shit. There's very few people that live that fake life. <clears throat> but once I unplugged from the fake life, got rid of the cell phone, even though I wanted to, I got to a place where I even used some magic mushrooms to get a little deeper, in a place where I realized that the most important thing I almost couldn't say it. That's you what almost screwed all the light. All yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck. Nobody leave. I have breaking news. And he just asked me a question. Um, Laird Scranton approached me before he left and probably told a lot of you this information that the, the, the Chinese lander that landed on the back side of the moon mm -hmm. detected two elements that come from only one place in our solar system. 
Mars. And Emmanuel, chemicals, yeah. And Emmanuel Valkowski, who's been right all along about Venus and Jupiter and everything, said that Mars came right by the moon. And, they, and the Earth and Mars exchange atmosphere. And we just proved that. And this is recent. Mars came by the moon and Earth and exchanged atmosphere recently. So, NASA's a fraud. They went to the moon to find evidence of planets in close proximity, and they were also looking for glass. That's why they went there. And now they're recently released dialogues of those astronauts on the surface. You can go get them, listen to them. 85% of their discussion is if they found any more glass. That was their mission. No one has ever been told the mission was to pick up glass on the surface of the moon. It was to make it to the moon. The glass so you think they made it to the moon? <laughs> we went to the moon. We went to the moon many times. But we can't go to the moon now because of cosmic rays. We were able to land on the spot between the moon and the earth because the moon is a shield. But now the level of cosmic radiation, if we even land on that spot and you get out, those astronauts will probably come back with cancer, leukemia. Can you imagine if we had a new space program where astronauts all went up, we had a big show and they all came back and three years later they are all dying? That's, going to be, that's not a show they want, so they can't get there now. You don't think they're and the whole story of Mars is even more ridiculous. The amount of cosmic radiation on Mars is a hundred times what it would be on the moon. Yeah, I thought the comment that the actual name of the mission is Apollo, who is a Greek god of the sun. Why would you name a mission after the Greek god of the sun? If you're going to the moon. moon. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. The, the glass they were looking for on the moon, that was the indicator of the sun? It was green. It was green glass? Yeah, just like the scarab in, uh, on the pharaoh. Is that from the that's, that's from solar eruptions. Plas it's from a plasma event. Plasma event. It could actually be the sun. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Moldavite could be the sun and not the earth melting and going up into space and falling back down. That's a cockamamie story. The earth, the sun exploding and depositing on the moon and the earth is not, is very believable. So the glass I may have on my neck is maybe the sun. And the Egyptians probably knew that. Because one day they were worshiping Saturn and then all the shit bar loose, it got really bright and there was this other sun. And they were like, what the is going on? And maybe their machines shut down because of that. Maybe they all died because of that. In a new cosmogenic environment, maybe these ancient people couldn't live there. <coughs> but we can live here, which is why we feel alien. Because some of our genes were back in Eden. And that's why many of us get sunburned. We're not supposed to be in front of this sun. There's no reason why a species on Earth would get sunburned if we'd been here for millions of years, because we would have evolved with all dark skin if we lived with this sun. Uh -huh. So the reason we're still, some of us are burning is because we're the descendants of the Eden time and we're still mixing with the people of the new sun time. That's why it sucks to be English. Did you ever know that? The, the British people are pale fuckers. <laughs> and guess what we just figured out through science? The pharaohs come from Britain. They were white pale people. Have you noticed that they were not the, Egyptians. All the commercials are getting all inter... Have you noticed that, like, oh, it's black and white now? Have you ever noticed that? Like, everything has been black and white. They're I can tell you that the color of your skin tells you nothing about who you are, because we're all homo sapiens sapiens. So if you look at a pile of ants, they're all different colors too, but they all look brown to us. <laughs> So I think this has been a fantastic conference. I want to thank all of you for coming out. Thank you, Dan. The most important person is actually my partner because she put up with all the shit that took me to get this together. So thank her. And we're going to have some awesome auctions in the atrium in a minute. I'm going to try to bring the live stream down so we can film everybody going crazy. And we're going to hang out for another hour or so, uh, and then everybody's going to break down. Oh, we're staying. I need to sleep. Sleep when you get old. Oh, she does deserve it.